He worked alone for many years, helped only by his partner and an occasional apprentice. He toiled tirelessly to develop new methods to reach perfection in body movement, some borrowed, some created, adding inventions of his own to better encourage the body into a state of physical bliss. He dreamt of bringing his contrology method to the entire world, to the sick and infirm, and to keep the healthy strong, and to extend the term of their lives. His name was Joe, Joe Pilates. There was a lot to Joe that was a test. He was c completely uninterested in anyone who was not deeply interested in what he was doing. He just didn't have any, didn't care who they were, or what they were, or they could have been the president of the United States, or he didn't care a thing about them unless they cared deeply about contrology. You know, he, he was a showman. He was definitely, definitely a showman, and he and he and he knew how to take advantage of that. And and you know, you can you can just you can imagine it. You see him in his videos. You know, he has that presence of a guy that's on stage. You know, he can command an audience. He certainly had all the ingredients. He had the passion. He had the knowledge. He had the resources to present himself in a certain way. I mean. In the 1940s, he published some marketing materials that are so incredibly elaborate and sophisticated. The um, Around the Clock brochure, where he um, painstakingly cut out pictures and put them together to create this brochure that he could give out to people. Um, there's another um, eight-pager that he handed out at the time when his book came out. Um, beautiful pictures. Um, there's a picture of him posing as a Greek statue. He had a great sense of um, graphic design, if you will, to promote his work and to be seen. You know, he built the Wanda Chair. He made all those films about getting it in every hotel room and every living room in America. And, you know, he, he wrote Return to Life and he had all the pictures at the end and the how to do it. I mean, was there even a how to exercise book before? I don't know, but people didn't even know about exercise, really. So, um, you know, he was such a pioneer and such a, such a creative genius, and yet, you know, as what people say, is he, he died very bitter. I, I think he was a very regimented kind of guy. He was, it was my way or the highway. This is my impression of what he was like. He was not a pussycat. Romana, the stories that she told him of him made me think that he was a very caring person. Um, and that he really, more than anything else, wanted you to move. You see old footage of him working people out and pushing people, you know, and it's like, well, you did that today. I don't know how well that would go across. But in his day, he believed so much in going past, a little bit past that limit and pushing people, and people would get results. There is no question that he was a visionary. There is no question he was infinitely and incredibly creative. There is no question that he was a man truly ahead of his time. He's looking for you to be an extension of him. He never learned your name. He didn't you know, call anyone by name. He, he didn't know whether you were married or not. He didn't know anything about you and he cared less. He was so repetitive. He did, I don't know, any more singular focus man I have ever thought of or known of in my life. A singular focus to just keep putting this on people. I have an image of Joe Pilates as a gruff, redneck, 
kind of sexist man, just pushing and not this delicate flower, but in the trenches, making it happen. How is it possible in one lifetime that he could create so many um, functional movement environments and create movement vocabulary in those environments and start a whole um, start a whole method as a, pretty much a single practitioner? Change happens through movement, and movement heals. So, yes, the name Pilates, I always tell clients that was his name. And I think it gradually became, I'm going to Joe, I'm going to see Pilates, I'm going to do Pilates, but it was never called that. It was body controlology. And the thing I love about the name body controlology is that the word control is built into there. Physical fitness is the first requisite of happiness. And I think that Pilates is the first requisite of physical fitness. Pilates is for anyone, but not for everyone. What do I mean by that? I mean anyone can do Pilates, but not everyone's going to love it, and that's fine. And why Pilates? Because it is an incredible system of physical, mental, emotional conditioning. It allows you to be at peak performance Whatever that peak may be, because it's very individual, it's, it's completely non-competitive. Pilates is non-competitive and it should be. It's definitely corrective exercise. Um, and I think that Pilates is something that brings balance. And not balance in terms of being able to stand on one foot, but it brings balance of your body of your mind. When your body and mind have balance, you have a good energy or spirit. And I do believe Joseph Pilates hit it on the nail when he said Pilates is a combination, it's a perfect balance of body, mind, and spirit. Because um, if your body and your mind are in symbiosis of one another and working in harmony, you're going to have a much better outlook. Pilates is living life with consciousness and care. It's not about, it's an ab exercise or a bicep or a curl. It, it's about the whole body. And we bring that energy through the whole body. If we adapt that to the way we live, we're living Pilates, we're doing Pilates. It's this whole body system uniquely designed by this brilliant man that includes all the equipment and it has order and rhythm and flow, but its intention is so clear. To me, the intention is to uniformly develop the body. In other words, organize it back to its most balanced, healthy place so that it can breathe, so that it can circulate all that oxygen, detoxify itself, and really be absorbent. Well, Romana said, can you define Pilates in three words? This is the first thing she ever said to me. And I was completely, I had no words. So I just said no. And she said, strength, stretch, and control. And it's the best part is it makes you use your brain. Let's go to work. Um, so for me, Pilates is really, that ultimate control, that confidence in your body. I think of the Pilates method as the owner's manual for the body. And I also feels like, feel like it counteracts all the shit that we do to ourselves all day long. It's the antidote. I, I equate Pilates a lot with life. 
In fact, I equate Pilates totally with life. It's like always trying to reach a little bit beyond where you are, always trying to go a little further than you are, always trying to be a little bit better than you are. Not comparing to anybody else. Not saying I want to be better than you or I want to be better than you, but it's it's more of wanting to be better for yourself. And so Pilates for me is life. So it's healing, it's it's an art form, it's a science, it's it's all the things that we are as human the good things, the not so good things, to transform us to become the best human we can be. Pilates is a, a, it's like a philosophy to me. So it's a many things. Um, it teaches you everything. Like even, like, it's, it's, it's a physical thing, but it was a mind. So that is really, uh, that's what I say most. So it's a very uh, important to know. Uh, if you know it, um, it helps for everything, for living lives. Pilates is a way for me to help myself and hopefully others understand themselves, become more of themselves. You should do Pilates because you're going to feel better. You should do Pilates because you're alive and it's a practice of movement which doesn't come in daily life anymore. Um, you should do Pilates no matter who you are, what happened to you, or what you think is going to happen to you, because it will make all of that a little easier. Uh, you should only do Pilates if you want to feel more vital, and if you want to feel yourself being alive, if you want to look inward, and even if you don't, honestly, if you just do it, it ends up happening. You know, I'm in my 46th year of doing it, and I'm, I'm still, I, I'm not bored at all. I still love it. And, and I can see the, the change in my clients, and I, I, it's what I want to do. Pilates has given me the creative platform um, in which, uh, from which, in which um, I evolve in order to be more myself. <laughs> and uh, without it, I'm sure I'd be living, but I just can't imagine what form that would take. Pilates is as individual as you are. So it will give you what nothing else will give you and balance you from top to bottom. Pilates is not a core workout. It's a total body workout. Joe said, Pilates is good for the body. Time and progress are synonymous terms. Nothing can stop either. Truth will prevail, and that is why I know that my teachings will reach the masses and finally be adopted as universal. Joseph Pilates um, was born in Mönchengladbach in 1883. And he was the second child of his parents. He had an older sister called Maria, and there were, yeah, um, seven more um, children to come in the family. The, they had nine children in the end, but three of them died as young, as babies or as um, young children. And so I have also here in the hand the Geburtsurkunde von Josef Pilates, die ist erstellt worden am 10. Dezember 1883, also einen Tag nach seiner Geburt. Mönchengladbach, damals Münchengladbach, 10. Dezember 1883. Der Schlosser Heinrich Friedrich Pilates, wohnhaft zu Gladbach, Waldhauser Straße 20, katholischer Religion, zeigt an, dass von der Helena geborene Hahn, seiner Ehefrau, katholischer Religion, wohnhaft bei ihm zu Gladbach in seiner Wohnung am 9. Dezember des Jahres 1883 nachts um halb 1 Uhr ein Kind männlichen Geschlechts geboren sei, welches die Vornamen Hubertus Josef erhalten habe. Vorgelesen, genehmigt und unterschrieben und dann folgt die Unterschrift von seinem Vater, eben von Heinrich Friedrich Pilates und schlussendlich vom damaligen Standesbahn. Ja, zumindest ein sehr beeindruckendes Foto hier in diesem, 
in diesem Fotoalbum aus den 1930er Jahren und darin befindet sich an dieser Stelle eine Aufnahme der Waldhausener Straße und hier sind auf der rechten Seite erkennbar die beiden Häuser, die heute nicht mehr existieren und das anschließende Haus, das einer, einem Juwelier Lukas damals gehörte und heute immer noch einer Juwelierfamilie gehörte, das also war das heute noch existierende Geburtshaus von Josef Pilates. Der weitere Weg von Josef Pilates ist dann bemerkenswert. Wenn man nämlich alle Einträge der Adressbücher von 1880, also das waren noch die Einträge seiner Eltern, verfolgt bis zum Jahre 1900, bis er von Mönchengladbach wegzog nach Neuwerk, dann stellt man fest, dass die Familie 18 Mal den Wohnort gewechselt hat, auf relativ engem Raum, also 18 Mal. Und eine Erklärungsmöglichkeit, wir sind da nicht sicher, aber es ist gut möglich, dass die Familie aus äh, finanziellen Gründen oft den Wohnort gewechselt hat, weil in der Zeit viele Häuser neu gebaut worden sind und es damals durchaus vorkam, dass eine Familie ein neu gebautes Haus trocken wohnte. Das heißt, es war frisch gebaut. Man konnte da noch nicht richtig einziehen, aber für arme Familien, die dann für wenig Geld dort wohnen konnten, war, bestand dann die Möglichkeit, dort eben zu wohnen, das Gebäude zu heizen und damit auch äh, dafür zu sorgen, dass es schneller trocken wurde und dann richtig bewohnbar wurde. Wie ging es nun weiter mit Josef Pilates hier äh, in Mönchengladbach? Wir wissen, dass er 1900 die Stadt verlassen hat. In der Nachbarschaft lag die Gemeinde Neuwerk. Das ist heute ein Stadtteil von Mönchengladbach. Und dorthin zog er 1900, genau am 28. Juli 1900. Und hier steht Hubert Josef Pilates und als Gewerbe, das ist also der Beruf, Bier, Brauer, Lehrling. Daher wissen wir, dass er zu der Zeit in Neuwerk den Beruf des Bierbrauers erlernen wollte. Und wir wissen auch noch wo, denn hier ist zu finden, er wohnte bei Hermann Koten in Engelbleck und davon wissen wir wiederum, dass er eine Gastwirtschaft mit Bierbrauerei betrieb. Aber dort ist er nicht lange geblieben. Im, am 22. November 1900 zieht er dann aus Neuwerk, etwa 40 Kilometer von hier entfernt, nach Heinsberg, dort in den Ort Dremmen. Und damit, bis auf eine kleine Ausnahme, ist äh, dann seine Phase in Mönchengladbach zu Ende. Joseph Pilates later often told that he was a sickly child and that he had asthma and all kinds of diseases and I, I couldn't find evidence for that. And I'm pretty sure he just had the normal diseases of children as a child and but that he was a robust and strong child because otherwise he wouldn't have lived. And he was um, being taught bodybuilding by his father because his father was a gymnast and um, and he like spent all his free time in the Turnverein in Mönchengladbach. So he took Joseph as a child and he learned all the exercises of gymnastics as a child. And, and, and um, Joseph's father, he, um, he was one of the first people interested in bodybuilding in Germany because bodybuilding only developed in the end of the 19th century. One of the few things we know about Joseph Pilates' childhood and his upbringing is that he did not grow up in a very wealthy family. Um, even though Germany was a very healthy country at the time, um, his family was struck by sickness and disease. Uh, I think there were three um, deaths in his family, including his mother and two of his siblings. Um, so I think growing up around that, um, as well as around a father who um, was really passionate about gymnastics at the time, I think he saw a relationship between um, you know, making the best 
of what you have as well as um, taking care of yourself to the best of your ability. And I think that fostered a really strong um, understanding of how important it is to take care of your body. When he was uh, 17 years old, his younger brother, his younger sister, and his mother passed away. And he became obsessed with health and that how do you create suffering? You know, watching your mother die, how do you make someone become strong? He went on to perform in very small circuses, small tiny German circuses, and they went over to England to perform in the summertime in Blackpool for the tourists. World War I broke out on August 4th, 1914. They sent all the women and children and men over 50 and under 16 back to Germany, and everybody else they moved into internment camps. So Joseph Pilates was sent to the Isle of Man, along with 27,000 other men. So it was a huge camp, and the most difficult thing for the people in turn there was the lack of occupation. So one of the people interned there, Paul Cohen Portheim, he later wrote a memoir, and he called it, Time Stood Still because that was just how they felt. They, the day was long and empty and they, they, they didn't know how long they would stay there because they had no idea how long the war um, would go on. The Isle of Man is a very interesting chapter in Joseph Pilates' biography. I think it's a very important one, but it's also a super mysterious one because um, this was the first of two world wars. A lot of documentation has just not stood the test of time, and um, we, there's very little even known about that particular chapter in, in war history in general. The whole story about him using springs and taking hospital beds apart and putting them back together and making a Cadillac out of them, um, f first of all, seemed very unlikely because springs were not um, something that the um, inmates had access to. Metal was not allowed in those camps. They slept on cotton and hay. Um, there was no luxurious mattresses that had springs on them to begin with. Um, also, the first patent of the reformer he later filed when he was back in Germany did not have springs in it. Springs didn't really find their way into his work until much, much later, um, until after he moved to the United States, where using springs and exercise equipment was pretty common. Um, he does mention the use of springs in his patent um, that he filed in Germany, but from what we know, he didn't use them until much, much later. It's entirely possible that he used the workshops that were available on the camp to start working with equipment and start developing some of it. Um, he certainly started developing his ideas at that point because it didn't take more than three years until after he was back, until he filed his first patent, uh, which was the foot corrector. So he started thinking about these things for sure at some point here, but it's, it's very unclear as to when. But for Joseph Pilatus, actually, the internment turned into a fortune. Because um, before that, he had always had this problem that he didn't have enough time for what he wanted to do for body culture. And now, he didn't have to work to support himself. He got um, something to eat. I mean, it was not much, but it was... So when he came back um, from the camp, he opened a boxing school in Gelsenkirchen. And he was, he was a member of the amateur boxing organization of Western Germany, but then he was thrown out because um, he was also boxing professionally. During that time when he was living in Gelsenkirchen, he also um, really developed his first um, devices. When he decided to go to America, he didn't take his wife or his children. Um, but when he boarded the ship in 1926, on the ship he met Clara Zeuner. If you would have sent me to the UK and then interned me and then sent me back here, um, 
I'm not sure how I would have felt, but no, he stands up and tries again. And he builds an, an association, a boxing association with another guy. Yeah? He's thrown out of a boxing association. He builds a new boxing association. He's creating events. Yeah, He's applying maybe for a job in Hamburg. We don't know how he went there, but actually he had not only one job there, right? He was with uh, people with Roima and with the military police. So he had two jobs already again in Hamburg. So. That's kind of crazy. He was doing so much. And then he pushed him up again and says, okay, I went to the UK and I was interned. Anyhow, I go now to the US. So uh, that's amazing. And I mean, he, I think he was really like, if he wanted something, he just did it. You know, it might have been cruel to his families. He left behind at certain points in life. But I think it, that was just the way he was. He was just so focused about the ideas and the work he had that he just had to do it, even if it made other people really yeah, suffer because of that. And it made people suffer, for sure. I realized that when he left Germany, he clearly had a dream. Um, you know, he, 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 had, he had a concept, he wanted, he wanted to do something with it. And how do I know that? I know that because he filed his patents in Germany, he filed his patents in the United States. So he wouldn't have done that unless, you know, unless he had, he had plans. Um, he gets to the United States and, and, and he, he gets himself published in, in National Magazine. So he had an article published in Collier's Magazine, which was like Life Magazine at the time, right? It was a competitor to Life Magazine. Um, and he's talking about anybody can do Pilates. You can be 60 years old and you can do Pilates. Now, if somebody didn't want their work to be out in the public, you don't write a book about it, you know? You just don't do it. You don't do the videos. You know, you don't get yourself in magazines, you keep it secret. He did not keep it secret. And then the part to me that was like the most surprising thing is he writes letters to John Kennedy, our president. And he says, and he basically says to Kennedy, you know, Contrology is what will save America. That's what he said. What was really his saving grace, or the reason that we still practice Pilates, is his instant success with the dance world. Because here he found reliable clientele, people that definitely got what he was up to, that needed this work in order to sustain longer careers, come back from injury, be back on stage in no time. I know that firsthand myself. Um, there was an instant marriage there that, whether he liked it or not, um, really helped him get out there in the larger world. I was looking at these different systems and I found so many, you know, um, traces of them in his method. So, um, yeah, I think this is the most interesting subject, the body culture um, around 1900 in, in Germany. Yeah, in, in Europe, um, because it really influenced his method. And I just saw a little article in the newspaper, and it, it had this man's picture. And there he stood with his big barrel bare chest, and his little mane of white hair, and his bare legs, and his tight little trunks, and he looked like a human lion. But I went over there and met him, and he was very available at that point. He was 76. He, it was 1959, and he comes up and, and really greets you, and I'm very serious, and he sees that, you know, he can tell that you're serious. And I said, I had some back problems, I've had slipped discs, and I know I need to work. And then right away, he's accepted you, he's accepted you. And he said, so you come three times a week. I think that the elders and understanding and studying the work of the elders is very important. It is the closest that we can get to Joe's work. Without the elders, we're grasping blind, you know? They were there, they know what the studio was like, they know what the movement was like. Let's face it, they come from a dance background, and they never went to Pilates to become Pilates teachers. They went to Joe and Clara, because each one of them had an injury, and that injury led them to the work. They stayed with the work because it worked for them. Pilates is not just a series of exercises. Pilates is a concept. 
It's a philosophy. Now, you can learn every exercise on every piece of equipment, and you don't know Pilates. I understand from Eve, Kathy, Bruce King, um, and another person who I can't right now call, recall his name, who all studied with Joe and Clara, that it was Clara that was the teacher. But Clara was an exceptional teacher who, when she saw you, watched you, it was you. It wasn't just a body. It was what you needed to hear and where you needed her to touch you. And you never forgot that touch. You got such information from that. Obviously, I knew about Joe Pilates and Carola spoke about Mr. Pilates, always with great reverence. She always talked about the Isle of Man, where he had been interned. She never told me that he was three blocks away in the city of New York. We walked and we walked upstairs one flight uh, to 939 8th Avenue. And that was where Joe had his studio all the time that he lived in New York City and he worked there. The studio faced 8th Avenue in the city of New York. 8th Avenue is a very, very busy street. The, we had uh, frames on the wall and picture frames. Uh, the w walls had a wood paneling and in these frames were little pictures of Joe uh, doing the exercises in their order and with the name of the exercise. And once you had learned, uh, come several times and they expected you, he expected you to learn uh, the work quickly and well, and then uh, you followed the frames. You followed the pictures on the frames. I'd learned Pilates from me. But now I was hurt. I couldn't even bring my knee up to my chest. I was so injured. And so, you know, I did things with my feet on the wall, my f lying down with my feet over this, imaginary movement, all kinds of things. And I slowly began to get better. <clears throat> I stayed as long as I could. I went back to the coast, and I think it was nine months later I was back on stage. And I think he, um, from what I understand, he gave Corolla permission in New York. She was the first um, person, and, and I don't know of anyone else who he actually gave explicit, explicit uh, permission to open another studio. Ron says is that when people would even hint about opening a studio and teaching Joe's work, um, Joe would say, I'll cut off their feet. <laughs> um, so literally, I mean, he was, he was very protective of his work and, and somewhat of, um, uh, there, there was a bit of an ego behind it. You know, he, he didn't feel that many people could represent him in the way that he wanted to be represented. And I understand that. Um, when Ron decided to open a studio in Los Angeles, uh, he asked Clara's permission. Cho was, was not with us at the time, so he asked Clara's permission. And um, she gave him her permission, and she said, just, you must stay true to the ABCs. Well, Ron was a very good showman. He came, come, comes from the show business and the dance world. Also did Vegas for years. I mean, he has a showman's quality and, and a magnetism. So people are drawn to him, listen to him. He also uh, got a lot of press at the time. Uh, in the ladies' magazines, which, you know, Cosmopolitan, Helen Gurley Brown was a friend of his. Uh, Nancy Reagan was an old pal of Ron's from the Broadway days. So all of that kind of press helped spread the word to get it out. The book again, as I mentioned earlier, was huge because that gave him even more press and then more write-ups. I don't think we'd be sitting here being interviewed about the importance of Pilates in the world now. I mean, it's astounding. She was really a friend and I think that after she opened her studio and it became so successful, 
I do think that Corolla got some of the notoriety and press that Joe would have wished for himself. And I think that there was probably a little bit of rivalry later on. Um, but everything that she learned, she learned from him and then took to the next level. Now, the way that she met Joe is very interesting. She had a dance injury, which led her to Dr. Henry Jordan, who was the chief of orthopedics at Lenox Hill Hospital. And Dr. Jordan suggested that she go to Joe his friend Joe for rehabilitation. And that's how they met. So Corolla was with Joe for 10 years. And in those days, you had to go minimum three times a week or not, or he wouldn't take you at all. In 1955, she was diagnosed with, or 56, right in there, with breast cancer. And at that time, <clears throat> the standard procedure to deal with breast cancer is radical mastectomy. So you come out of that surgery and they only do that if they find cancer so you go into it not knowing. <laughs> so she comes out and she has no breast and no pec major. Which means all of this is gone, right? And she's a dancer. And she said she was hysterical. That was it, I mean, just downright hysterical about the whole thing. And she went to Joe, hysterical, and he said, don't worry, we fix. And she started to work with him as soon as he said she could. And she said within a year, she was on stage. And when you see pictures of Eve dancing and there's this one, Thing. She's got these crazy things in her hair and she's leaping up in the air and this little, that's the dance she choreographed for herself a year after. When I think about Kathy Grant and how she envisioned the method, it really is directly related to her experience. So she went to Mr. Pilates as an injured dancer. And so when she did Pilates, she didn't just start on the reformer. She didn't just lie down and do the hundreds. They were, and so her theory about Pilates and the way you sort of think about the work is complete, directly related to that. So you warm up, like Kathy had to warm up. I, you know, she never just went into Mr. Pilates work right away. And so in the way Kathy sort of continued with the method was she w had all these warm-up exercises. But when you did Mr. Pilates work, you would go hundreds, roll-ups, roll-ups, like you would do the vocabulary and keep it intact as best as you can. So it was at once like, oh, I need this for my body. You know, that's what Kathy would do, like, you know, you need to warm up. But when it was time to do Mr. Pilates work, she was so respectful in another sense. So it was this interesting balance. I mean, Ramana rarely said anything not nice about. Actually, she never said anything not nice about Joseph Pilates, but she would say sometimes that he would get frustrated and he'd say, that's it, out. <laughs> and um, she said, Clara would come by and she'd say, okay, you, that's all right, come back tomorrow, everything will be okay. He's just a little upset. <laughs> and uh, so there, you kind of knew that Joseph Pilates had a certain character and that Clara Pilates had a different character. Um, I, but I would say she did talk about Joseph Pilates more, but she did talk about, you know, Clara, about how caring and nurturing she was. Ramana, when she was teaching us, the most important thing for her was to for us to understand that she was passing on Joe's work. Um, she was very clear, she'd say all the time, I'm not a genius, you're not a genius, he was a genius. Mr. Pilates was really short-tempered and he, um, you know, I think people forget that and what I love is that Kathy always talked about Mrs. Pilates, Clara, and how she would, you know, Mr. Pilates would either say yes or no and you would have to think about what it was about that that worked. And you'd have to, you know, he wouldn't tell you, oh, I really liked that because you really articulated through your spine. Hell no. Like, he wouldn't say that. He would just say, good, and you would, or yes, and you'd go, I wonder what it was that I did. When I went to him, he, he you know the hanging? Yeah. You know? He, okay. He put me, your feet, you're upside down, and you feed yeah. him in those yeah. little yeah. straps. And he said, I'll be right back. 
Uh -huh. He never came back. <laughs> <laughs> and I struggled. <laughs> I had to go to work. And, he, and I struggled. And, and in struggling, I made the ropes tighter. Oh, yeah. I was uh -huh. panicking. Twisted, I kept yeah. twisting and twisting and twisting and yeah. I moved and I did this. Yeah. And finally I calmed down, you know, and came. Oh, that's funny. He still hasn't come back. <laughs> but it's really important to talk about, um, talk about the use of the word Pilates as a trademark um, is really an important thing because if you go back to before that the whole lawsuit which which happened between roughly between the years 1992 and 19 well actually it started in 95 ish and then went to the year 2000 um, but the litigation actually started way before 1995 because there was lots of threats and cease and desist letters and there were other there were uh, there were multiple lawsuits before that so um, and I probably should start a little bit but but before I got sued Deborah Lesson got sued uh, Plies Institute got sued, Will Green got sued, um, there, was, uh, there was almost 200 cease and desist, and desist letters that got sent out, um, and, and people were just generally afraid to use the word Pilates. This was probably happening around August to September of the year the trademark was broken. Um, we came up with some names for the organization because we were afraid we couldn't use the word Pilates, so we had come up with the uh, the name the Exercise Alliance Association, the Exercise Alliance Foundation. We were trying to come up with something that was similar to, but not the same thing. And then lo and behold, the lawsuit came to an end and it was deemed to be a generic term for exercise in October of 2000. And in November of 2000, a little less than three weeks later at the Power Pilates Studio in New York City, we had a trademark cancellation party for the Pilates community. And we managed to get the mailing lists from Balanced Body and Peak. They were very kind to us. We did a hard copy mailing back then, postcards, inviting everyone to come to Miami Beach in May for the first meeting of the Pilates Method Alliance. And that's kind of how the whole thing happened. Um, that meeting in Miami was the first time that all of those people had ever been in the same room together at the same time. To achieve the highest accomplishments within the scope of our capabilities in all walks of life, we must constantly strive to acquire strong, healthy bodies and develop our minds to the limits of our ability. The studio at the time was not at all like Corolla's studio. Corolla's studio was immaculate. And Joe's was very relaxed. Uh, and not too clean, I have to say, because, you know, they were in their 80s. And uh, by the time they worked hard, the studio opened at 6.30 in the morning, closed at 7.30 in the evening. And uh, by the time they finished, they then went out to have something to eat. And they were exhausted. You tired and you went in and you did your lesson. and. They watched you, but nobody interfered with you. You did not chit-chat with anybody. You just were doing the work. And eventually, they would come and maybe lay a hand on you if they saw that you could release more. And there'd be a, always a count. One, two, three. And the emphasis was three. So if they were going to give you a push, and with Joe, it was like a bear walking up your back. It'd be one, two, three. You walk really almost right into the working part of the studio. There's no reception area, very curt instructions. Again, n nothing personal, nothing about me, uh, nothing. And we just started in. He never once said I did anything wrong. He never said I did anything good. He'd say okay, but there was 
very just do this, do that, keep, I kept moving, and the pace was pretty fast. There was no classes, there was no one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one training, no duets, no nothing. You didn't make an appointment. The moves can be invented. He let me invent. I would be inventing because I couldn't stand it as a young woman to do everything in the same order. As an intuitive, that's just an anathema. So I would do it backwards or I'd do it anyway just to keep myself standing. This repetition didn't come easily to me. And he would notice that. He, 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 didn't, he didn't have one way we should behave. And then when I do a brand new thing, he'd say, that's good. Just be sure you're using your whole body. The curtain opened and out stepped this guy who's like mostly naked. He's wearing this short bathing suit, the kind the Brazilians are familiar with. <laughs> and uh, he had a cigar in his hand and uh, he wore glasses. And I noticed right away there was something wrong with his eye, which I later discovered was a glass eye, an artificial eye. And so he was very sort of conscious of it. When I was taking pictures, he was always trying to move. He didn't want any pictures taken from a, a side angle, because if one eye you know, would look, the other wouldn't. So. Back in the, in the 70s and in the 80s, really for quite a long time, Pilates was considered to be kind of a boutique method of exercise. You, you always saw that there were CEOs of a company or a ballet dancer or somebody, an actress, who was doing Pilates. And what we wanted to do was to make it accessible to everybody. So the idea was to make it simple, clear, and useful. So it was, uh, that was, that was, I think that was the goal. When you come to a Pilates studio, the first thing you do, you spend the first couple of sessions learning the principles. So we understood they had to learn the principles. So there had to be principles to learn. So that was our first task. Our first task was to come up with clear principles which added up to the entire Pilates method. And then when he showed me the bednasium, he took me in the back room to show me that he had this bed that had a modified tower attached to it with springs, and he told me that uh, people who are uh, infirm, that come in sometimes in wheelchair, and they take him, he takes them in the bednasium and puts them on the bed, and then I, re I realized that was the place I should get my picture taken. So I said, let me try this. So I, I jumped onto the bed, I give my camera, I set my camera and give it to the reporter to take a picture of me, and I said, this is for Buddy, and so, I got on the bednasium and then he took the uh, roll down bar and put it in my hand and, uh, and I just started to do it and then he stopped and he said no and he said if you're going to be in the picture you have to be in the trunks, you know. So I said I, I don't have trunks. He goes I have trunks. And he told me in the dressing room there was a carton, you know a paper, a cardboard carton filled with a men's trunks, you know like 15 trunks, different sizes. So I went in there, took off all my clothes, went through the box, found the medium, you know, size, pulled them on, came out, got on the bednasium, and that's the picture that we took. I think once my book came out in 2000, that's when people started knowing that I was connected with Pilates, and so a lot of my, my parents' friends would come to me and say, oh, you do Pilates? I did Pilates with Joe. And then they would tell me a story about him. Um, always funny, <laughs> uh, unexpected, some of these stories. Um, he used his hands a lot, I'll say that. That's, I heard that a lot. Um, he was gruff, I did hear that a lot. Um, one of the, I think one of my favorite stories was, I, I was very into horseback riding. And back in the mid 90s, I was going to take a horseback riding expedition in Morocco. And in order to do that, I needed to call a horseback riding shop in New York in order to get my equipment. And when I was talking to the gentleman who happened to be the owner of Kaufman's studio, uh, Kaufman's uh, saddlery in Manhattan, 
he said to me, oh, you know, we were talking and he said, what, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going on a horseback riding expedition. He said, what do you normally do? And I said, I'm a Pilates teacher. And he said, Pilates, Pilates. is that like Joe Pilates? And I said, yeah. And I thought, what, what is this horseback riding guy I know about Joe Pilates? He said, that, that guy used to call me all the time and he used to order leather straps from me. He said, like reins, what were those for? And I couldn't believe it. I just thought it, it was so fun to brush up against Joe's legacy in New York. Well, this is Bob Wernick, the man who wrote the article for Sports Illustrated. And, uh, you know, he, I took a picture of him standing. Joe wanted him to stand on his stomach. And if you look at Joe's face, he's smiling. It's the only picture I took of Joe smiling. What, what's most important about Mary is that she didn't realize that at the time she was growing up, Pilates was going to become a form of exercise. And it was just her last name. At 82, she, <laughs> she could run down the street, hop, skip, jump, and play. She looked like she did those exercises every day, which she did, and I do have that on tape, um, every single solitary day, and the person's asking her, seven days a week? She said, that's how many days are in a week. Kathy was on West 57th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue, and Corolla was on West 58th Street and 7th Avenue, a few blocks away. So I would go to Corolla in the morning and train to teach. And then I go to Kathy in the afternoon for my, a few times a week for my lessons. And Kathy would always say, well, what are they doing over there? And I would say, well, I'm learning this, but could you explain it to me? So what was wonderful was both women had worked with Joseph Pilates, of course, but both women had a very different personality, a very different ethnic background, and a very different approach to the work. Uh, although it all had the same root, you could see very, very clearly. And I'll never forget what Corolla told me about teaching Pilates at the time. She said, well, you know, this career is a very hard career and you'll never be rich, but the rewards are more than money. The rewards are for the heart because you're really helping people. If I would have to define Joe Pilates with one word only, it would be genius. If I could have two words, two words to define Joseph Pilates, I would define Joseph Pilates as a fearless inventor. Power. A taskmaster. As a life. A creative genius. One word only, that's a hard one. I would say maybe empowering. Visionary. Joe Pilates was a visionary. For the man, I would say knowing he knew something. Define for you Joseph Pilates with one word. That will be hard, but um, legendary. I would say, I would say, I would say master. Extraordinary. I would have to say that it's love. Inspiration. There's a lot of other words I could use, but if I had to choose just one, it would be innovator.
Describing Joseph in one word, I, I am referring to um, his obituary in the New York Times, where they, they called him something like uh, a man with a, a lion's mane of white hair. I think he was a lion. We know he loved cats, but he had this voracious appetite for the work he was doing. In 10 sessions, you'll feel the difference. In 20, you'll see the difference. And in 30, you'll have a new body. Has Pilates changed my life? It's made my life. Um, it is my life. Pilates totally changed my life. Um, I don't know where or what I would be without Pilates. I suffer from congenital autoimmune diseases. And if I didn't have this work and do this work, I would be crippled. And every day that I get on my reformer and I get on my mat and I move, I thank Joe and all my teachers because at 52, I can still do things that I did in my 20s. Um, you know, this is something that needs to be shared with the world. And at this time, more than ever, people need to learn what we have to teach. And that is very, very important to me. I think that is more important. One person walked up to me today. These are the things that make me love what I do. I was terrified of your class last year. You scared the hell out of me. And I said, she goes, you hurt me. And I said, I hurt you. And she goes, you hurt my feelings, but in a good way. You made me do the exercises and no one really made me do that before. So I'm back again for a second class. Thank you. That's why I teach. Everything else that happens and all of the other cool stuff that occurred was all really cool, but to really change someone's life, that's what we do. That's the most important thing. I love movement, and I knew its efficacy for healing. Um, my younger sister, Daphne, who's age five, who is five years younger than I, um, had a very traumatic birth that um, left her unable to speak or to feed herself. And when we were together as children, um, and to this day, we have a very strong bond. And I think that it was, it's my relationship, our relationship that has shaped my nervous system. Um, I've had to realize that it's not possible for me to heal her, although I would love to. However, the skills that I learned as a result of living with her, being raised with her, are the very skills that I use every day with every one of my Pilates clients and every one of my classes. So I'm so grateful to Daphne, my sister, who's really my partner in this work. Come to find out, about five years ago, I was feeling symptomatic of, I don't know what people thought, maybe carpal tunnel. I couldn't move my thumb. I knew it wasn't carpal tunnel. So I kept investigating and then all of a sudden my arm started to atrophy and a, a spine surgeon said, well, it's coming from your neck. I said, well, okay, that sounds better than carpal tunnel. So they did an MRI of my neck and he said, yes, I see this nerve is impinged. Let me go in and release the nerve and you should be fine. I investigated further and found that I was um, plagued with ALS, which is probably one of the worst diseases I could ever, um, I could ever imagine having. ALS, what, me? I have to watch my body deteriorate and I can't work out, I can't this, I can't that. And I said, well, I'm gonna fight this thing. And I said to my doctor, 
What can I do? For, what's the best thing for exercise? He said, Pilates. I said, really? I said, oh, I, I think I got that one covered. What I've been telling students recently, um, because it's, it's true, but it's been very private to me, um, is that Pilates gave me a sense of peace. It gave me a sense of, of being very still and very centered um, when I'm still and when I'm moving. And it's, it's a rock solid core, um, not core, but just that, that sense of it's, it's, it's right there and it's very grounding. Patience and persistence are vital qualities in the ultimate successful accomplishment of any worthwhile endeavor. I love the idea that the whole world is learning Pilates as long as they learn it well. I think we can spread Pilates to everywhere more. We are doing a pretty good job of uh, getting it into the physical therapy or physiotherapy world. That's, that's kind of a known thing now. And when we see students who are in physical therapy school, they're asking us for Pilates. Where can I do an internship that has Pilates? So that, I feel like that's going along pretty well. I feel like we could do a better job with getting it into um, like a community center or somewhere where people don't have the same, maybe the same financial background, you know, they, they can't afford a lot of Pilates. I think we could do a much better job of getting Pilates into different areas where, uh, even if it's free and we give back to the community, that I definitely think we could do better. And we can do better with um, getting it into the schools and having our children do it. Um, that again is something that the PMA is very interested in. It's a huge initiative, the Pilates for Youth. And so I'm, I'm very happy to say that it is starting to move along faster, but I, I think we can also do, we can do better with that. I see Pilates in the future uh, as a continuous growth um, in the industry. I feel that there are a lot of people that still don't know about it um, and it's going to continue to grow and I think that's wonderful. The, uh, what, what I see the future with, with the technique is what, how I work with my training course and with my studios is that it's very important to know where the technique came from and the base and how uh, Joseph Pilates worked and how he put it all together. But I think it's important to, um, to look very carefully at what the client needs. We've changed, our, our, our uh, phys physicalities have changed in the last 40, 50 years. And I think we have to take into consideration that. I have great hope for it. And I think the cream rises to the top. Because People know when their bodies are changing and, and feeling better and out of pain and aligning themselves, you know. So that'll keep a good studio going. The clientele, otherwise you're gonna see that storefront empty. Really looking at the person in front of them. So that's, that's I think like my, my, the thing I hold on to the most because, you know, it's, it, the world is so big. The world is so big, so how can we all, you know, I, you, not everyone's going to get a Kathy Grant. I understand that. So I hope that people really just are doing their best and really looking at the body in front of them as opposed to being like, and you do it this way because that's the exercise. I want them to go, oh, no, you should do it this way because your body needs to do it this way. That's my goal that, or the, my dream for Pilates. I see my path now as taking Pilates to a level that maybe he wanted it to go uh, with my disease. I'm more than uh, passionate about helping people with MS, with Parkinson's, with all that, um, all those neurologic diseases that we don't know that much about, right? But I'll be out there fighting, whether I'm in a wheelchair, or whether I can stand, or whether I can or can't talk. I'll be fighting this for the rest of my life. I think what is interesting at this point in time in, in the Pilates industry and in the public perception of Pilates, there are so many teachers that come into the work at this time that have no real need to even familiarize themselves with the history of the work, where it comes from, the rich tradition of it. 
Um, and I think that's fine to a degree. I don't think everybody needs to know all the details and the biography of Mr. Pilates himself. But uh, what fascinated me and what I think is important to, to bring forth to a new generation of teachers is, is the, the origins of the work in terms of its philosophy and the concepts. Because I see um, that Pilates is really the last remaining window into the time of physical culture, which is a time where people were much healthier, much more aware of their bodies, uh, much more in tune with using using movement and exercise as a way to keep themselves healthy rather than just fit. I'm not concerned with bodybuilding. I'm just trying to make people normal human beings. He was suffering from periods of depression because he felt, and we used to call him Joe's having a bad day because he felt that he had not accomplished what he wished to accomplish with the method. Yeah, Joseph Pilates had many visions and missions in his life. He wanted it um, in schools, and so that's my big focus, is actually getting Pilates for children. And in his book, Your Health, um, he said, first educate the child. And it was about creating a good foundation if you have a good foundation, you're able to build something strong on top of it. And so he believed that children really should be doing his work. Children, actually, they give you so much, and it's really a joy to teach them. And also, they love the work. And uh, so when I'm teaching children, in a way, I feel like I'm helping, you know, the dream of Joseph Plotties to, you know, get it out to the children. And it's very fulfilling in many ways. We're so fortunate to be able to continue in the vein, in the direction, in the current that Joseph Pilates created. The very first patent application states that his reformer could be used by people who had difficulty with their legs or even by somebody with one leg. And in addition, we know that Joseph Pilates worked with people from, from the war and helped to support them in their rehabilitation, in their therapeutic process for regaining their vitality. So here we are, um, you know, in the, in the 2000s, following in Joseph Pilates' footsteps, following the path that he had created. I had the very good fortune of collaborating with Mike Podlensky in San Diego, with Hadar Schwartz in Tel Aviv, Israel, with Jesse Lee and Jojo Bauman in Copenhagen, Denmark. And all of us shared a common enthusiasm for making the Pilates techniques supportive of and accessible to polytrauma patients from the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Pilates Method Alliance and Elizabeth Anderson and she asked if um, we had a name and we said well no polytoma Pilates not really catchy you know uh, she asked if we had an administration or a home office and we said well no it's just us working with our patients and working with our clients in studios around the in four points around the world so she graciously generously um, offered that Pilates Method Alliance could become the home and founded the name Heroes in Motion. That was when another moment when I was just so grateful that the, um, the work that a few had started, it's always the case, you know, pass it forward. The work that a few had started would now be carried forward to be expressed by any Pilates teacher in their home community. And his third vision was everyone should be doing my work. It should be in every household. It should be around the world. Um, they, they all should know what my work is. Joe's vision of the method was like a universal reformer. He expected 
to be able to change the world through the method. The mind, when housed within a healthful body, possesses a glorious sense of power. His death was about this time of year, and all I know about how he got to the hospital was that he was having terrible trouble breathing. I went to the hospital to see him, and uh, there he was. He was uh, had oxygen. He was taking oxygen, and he was extremely agitated. The only thing that was really alive about him was his anger. I mean, he was just furious. But, and I again, I don't know how many days I went to visit him, but there came a time after two or three or four days where he became calmer. And then one day I was there and I could see he was weak getting weaker and weaker, whether that's because of an infection he had or his emphysema, not being able to absorb enough oxygen. And I left him around 11 o'clock. He was very calm. And before I left, he would ramble on a little about contrology. It was a, his one, <laughs> Johnny one note. Uh, and he said, someday, everybody's going to be doing this. That's what he said. I went home, which was then only about 10 blocks away. Next morning he was dead. He died about 2.30 at night. So. I'm proud that he could go through so much failure and be two days from death and have that never give up his dream. I'm telling you that we all know, and this movie will be testament to the fact that, you know, over a hundred years later, he, this guy was onto something. He was way ahead of his time and the method works. The Pilates method works. Joe thought that he had discovered he believed that he had discovered the secret to human longevity, happiness, gracefulness, contentment. He thought it was all wrapped up in contrology. And he thought it would cure disease and prevent disease. And he was absolutely convinced of this. And no one listened to him. I mean, they didn't laugh at him. I must be right, never an aspirin, never injured a day in my life. The whole country, the whole world should be doing my exercises. They'd be happier. If I met Joe Pilates now, the first thing I would say, Joe, you wouldn't believe that there are probably over 10 million people doing your exercises. So what I would say to Joseph, or what I would ask Joseph is, um, where would you take the work? Um, where would you take it from here? And, and my understanding is um, that you uh, were constantly developing, thinking, creating, um, and you also had certain rules. Um, I would also want to know, um, everyone refers to, to what, how you taught as, as teaching from a place of principles. And what would you consider to be your principles, the, the main defining concepts behind your work? Um, we think we know what they are, but I, I'd love to hear that from you. Thank you, Joe, from the bottom of my heart for this work because it has provided me with more inspiration and love and joy than you can ever imagine. I would say that I love you and thank you for changing my life through Pilates. 
You know, I, I would have a thousand questions for him, but, but the one thing I would say to him, the one thing I would say to him is, is I, would, I would thank him because it seemed like in a very thankless way he beat his head against a wall trying to get people to do Pilates for his whole life. And, and in, even at the time when he died, he knew that something was going to happen, but he didn't get to see it yet. And, and I, so I guess I would, I, would, I would thank him for his tenacity and his perseverance. And, 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 I, would, and, I, would, and I, would, I would tell him that what he was thinking, that, that, you know, that, 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 that Pilates would be a thing you know, in 50 years, that, that he really was 50 years ahead of, time, of his time, and he was really right about that. And, and you know, that would be probably it. I think that you have inspired me. Your spirit has inspired me to be strong and to push through everything I've had to push through and to try to be inspiring to other people as well. But your inspiration and your strength and your uh, steadfast, steadfastness to what you believe in, your drive. I don't know if I've ever seen or heard of anything like it. Joe, I really wish you were around now to see what difference you have made in the world. I recall you asking me how, uh, to touch my toes and I couldn't. And then you went down and put your palms on the floor and stood up and said, 2480, you're 24 and I'm 80. And uh, it was a little bit humiliating to feel that way. And he said, you come back here two times a week in these six months, you'll be just like me. Unfortunately, Joe, my life interrupted me. <laughs> And uh, it took me uh, 40 years uh, to start doing your work. But you were right. I'm grateful to you. I'm glad you did what you did. I think if I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Pilates, that I would, I would probably thank him um, for, for creating this wonderful work and tell him that I hope in my heart that I've done it justice, um, that I've moved it forward without losing the spirit and his intention. Joe, I wanna know, how am I doing? What do you think? And what can I do better? Did I do okay? Was it okay that, you know, I put an organization together? Was that what you wanted? And if it wasn't, please come to me in a dream and tell me what it is that you want so that I can do it again. And I would like to apologize on behalf of society that they didn't get it back when you were alive. But I hope that somewhere you know that we are carrying on those visions, that the world is accepting and acknowledging your genius, your visions. I know you said 50 years ago that you were 50 years ahead of your time. And I hope you know that right now your time has come and that we hope we stay on the correct path to take you into the future. Who dreamed of changing the world? who made the world a better place, fulfilling a promise to make children healthier, women stronger, men more graceful, and the elderly sturdier, safer, and longer lived. Joe Pilates did, and you can do it too. With Joe's inspiration and with the tools that he's given you, what are you waiting for? The world is right in front of you. Be inspired. Change it now.